I think we're going to go ahead and get rolling here. Uh, I'm sure people are still still coming in from lunch, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so the session is remotely virtual, which is about remote teams or virtual teams. Uh, so if that's not what you thought you were coming to, you can leave if you want to. Um, I'm Karen Stevenson, and uh, let's let's go ahead and talk about this. I am uh, I'm a uh, been involved with Drupal since, uh, well, for about seven years. And I uh, am the co-maintainer of CCK and uh, maintainer of date and calendar and a bunch of other things like that. <laughs> um, so, that so that's how I got connected to Drupal. Um, I work for Lullabot Consulting. Uh, we're a big Drupal shop. You know, we do a lot of training. We do a lot of consulting. Uh, and we do a lot of web development work, front end to back end, uh, design and everything else, and lots of big, um, lots of big sites that we've worked on, Martha Stewart and Grammys.com and WWE and uh, lots of others as well. So this man right here is my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle, holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you, you hear the stories, it's... I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. All right. I love that commercial. Herding cats. So uh, does managing a remote team feel a little bit like herding cats? <laughs> yes, it does. Um, so let's, let's start, people throw around the terms virtual and remote kind of interchangeably, but they're really not the same thing. So let's talk about terminology for just a second. So virtual means something that doesn't really exist, right? Something that's sort of simulating or pretending to be something else. Um, and remote means things that are far away, uh, something that's not close. So for instance, Drupal, is uh, the Drupal community is a virtual team. The, Drupal is not a company that you can join. You can't, you can't get hired at Drupal. You can't get fired by Drupal. Uh, you decide to be a part of it, and, and uh, Drupal can't do anything about it, more or less. Um, so that's a virtual team, and we obviously have remote members on this team. They're, they're international. It's all over the, all over the world. I used to, when, when people asked what I did, I used to say I am a remote employee on a virtual company. Um, but that's not actually true, because Lullabot is not really a virtual company. It's, it's a real company. Uh, but we do have remote employees. In fact, that's all we have is remote employees. So it's kind of unusual in the sense that we don't really have anybody who's not remote, uh, unlike a lot of teams uh, where remote is kind of the uh, exception. At Lullabot, remote is, is what everybody is. Um, and then Lullabot, in turn, participates in virtual project teams with lots of other people. So we, uh, we work with a client, and we end up with a project team that is partly comprised of, Drupal, of our Lullabot people and partly comprised of people from uh, the, the client that we're working with. And in some cases, another vendor is involved. In some cases, there are multiple departments uh, from the other from the client or whatever. So we end up on a lot of these virtual teams. So again, that's, that's, that's a team of people that's come together for a purpose, but they're, you know, that, that's where the virtual comes in, and, and it has remote members. So we've got a lot of kind of variations um, of all of this. So who exactly is remote? Uh, well, the obvious answer is you've got an in-house team and uh, you've got remote contractors. So a company might have remote contractors that they bring in to do certain things, like work on a website. Um, you can have a company that has remote employees. So maybe there are individual employees in the company that work from home or work from someplace um, that's not the same place that everybody else works with. 
You can have remote offices. Remote offices are interesting because people a lot of times don't think about remote offices when they talk about remote employees. But a remote office is sort of this, in the same boat as a remote employee. A lot of times they're kind of the forgotten stepchild that um, kind of is out of the loop and doesn't know what's going on at the mothership. Um, and I would, I would say that it even goes a little farther than that because if you've got people who are working while they're traveling, you've got people who are temporarily remote and they need, they need to be able to function and do their job, but they're not connected. They don't have the connection. Uh, you can have people that are working from home during emergencies and that could be either the emergency of the employee, um, you know, my kid is sick and I don't have a babysitter, I'm going to have to work from home today, or it could be... Uh, We've had a blizzard and, and I, can't get, I can't get to work. Or it could be something's happened at work and, I, and, and work isn't there. <laughs> and I've got to work from home. Um, and you can have uh, open source and joint venture projects, which is kind of where Drupal falls in, right? That you've got this virtual community of people uh, that's working together on a, on a mutual project. And I would venture, I would actually say that you can even take it a step further. Uh, there is research now that says that even, you know, you've got, you've got companies where people are working in different buildings and those people may be somewhat remote from each other. There's actually research that says uh, teams that have members in the same building but just on different floors actually have some of the same kinds of problems that distributed teams across the country have because you know, if you're not there, if you're not right in front of everybody, um, that's a little different. Uh, so uh, many teams have remote elements, probably more teams than anybody really realizes because if, uh, if somebody says, you know, we don't, we don't have remote uh, in our company, uh, most likely you have one of these things. The only people that really, only companies that really don't have any remote uh, employees at all would be a very small company where everybody is physically in the same location and you never work with anybody else. Um, and that's probably not that many. So if you go back to kind of the traditional idea of, you know, remote means people are working from home and uh, they can work from wherever they are, uh, the benefits are obvious, right? You've got access to the best talent wherever that, that talent may be, gives you a, a wider pool of employees. Uh, your employees have more of a global perspective. It's not just this narrow little group of people that um, work right where you do. Uh, they may be more productive and more available uh, because they're not commuting, they're not wasting their time uh, doing this, that kind of thing. And they may be less expensive because you don't have to uh, pay for a desk in an office building. They're, they're working from home. So there's a lot of benefits. Uh, what's coming into play more and more is employers are beginning to realize that having the ability for people to work remotely is, um, is actually kind of business interruption insurance. Um, a, a client that I work with, uh, you know, the Hurricane Sandy, how many businesses were unable to work in New York City after Hurricane Sandy? And those that were already set up um, with the capability of uh, allowing people to work remotely were able to continue to do business as normal even though their offices were actually shut down. So um, it turned out to be kind of business interruption insurance. So there's some employers that uh, don't embrace this idea of remote employees. There's been a lot of discussion about what does this mean that Yahoo said we don't want people working from home. And I don't think, personally, I don't, I don't see that as any kind of like a smear on the idea of working remotely. I think Yahoo is just a special case. They've got their own reasons for doing what they do and uh, wanting to do what they want to do. And I don't think in any way, shape, or form it means that remote work is going away or it's not important or there's a new trend coming or anything like that. It's, it's just their particular situation. <coughs> there's a lot of things that employees love about it. Um, you've got a flexible schedule. You've got the ability to do some work-life balance. You don't have commuting. You've got fewer interruptions. Those things are great. Um, but it comes with responsibility. So you can't just be a remote employee and just say, you know, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. You, you, you have some responsibilities that come with it. So I, I've come up with like my five commandments for team members. There's probably more than five, but five seems like a nice number. Um, so you will spend much time on the phone. Um, one of the things we tell people when they come to work for Lullabot for the first time, if they haven't been, especially if they haven't worked remotely before, is 
uh, be sure you get yourself a new phone plan because you are going to be on the phone a lot. And I think almost everybody doesn't believe that enough and ends up with like a $500 or $1,000 phone bill the first month that they're working and then they're going, oh my God, you really meant it. Yeah, yeah, we really mean it. You're gonna be on the phone a lot. Um, you have to be visible and accessible. Uh, you cannot just drop into a black hole and disappear. That's, that won't work. And in fact, um, when we have people like that, and, and sometimes this happens, you get somebody on a remote team who just doesn't get how do you work remotely, and they do just sort of disappear during the day and you know, maybe throw some code over the wall every once in a while. Um, it, it doesn't work. You, you, can't, you can't function that way. Um, part of the agreement for somebody to be in a remote employee is they have to understand that you have responsibilities. So you can't, and you can't disappear without explanation. You can disappear, um, everybody can't always be visible everywhere, but you've got to let people know what's going on. Um, you must over communicate, and that is everybody. That is management has to over communicate and employees have to over communicate. And you, you can't over you can't do too much of that. You, you have to excessively communicate. And there is no way to do this successfully without understanding how to use the virtual tools. So uh, if, if you don't know or you don't want to learn how to use virtual tools, um, you know, people in this room probably don't have any problem with that at all, but, but we, you do have teams where there are people who are not comfortable with virtual tools, and that can be a real problem. Um, I, wanna, I wanna reiterate commandment number one. You will spend a lot of time on the phone. Now, there are some potential problems that come with remote uh, workers. Um, isolation, you know, people are not in a group of people. They, they may not feel like they belong. They may feel like they're kind of cut off from everyone else. It may be hard for people who are working remotely to feel a sense of rapport with the rest of the team. Um, it, it's nice to work remotely to, to have that work-family balance, but the work-family balance can kind of go the other way, which is you can have them colliding into each other and you can't separate them enough. Um, that, that can turn into a problem. Uh, remote employees can have trouble seeing the big picture. You know, I'm, I'm just me sitting here at home doing my little piece of the work and I don't understand all the other work that's going on and I don't know where my little piece fits into the big picture and that can be a, a problem. And I lose that casual contact that, that you get when you're all physically in the same building. You just don't have it. But we can work around all these things. So one of the things that we have to do is we have to have the right infrastructure in place. Um, so uh, these are just some quotes from, I've got some quotes scattered through here from people that are working on virtual teams that kind of said, you know, what, what works and what doesn't work on our virtual team? Um, what, what's the, what, what makes it successful or not? And one of them is virtual teams are forced to be better organized and follow clear procedures. And that is really true. Um, you cannot assume uh, anything. Uh, what we find is y you need to have a team identity and a lot of times you need to have some sort of an intranet or you know a point of central contact for uh, the remote team or for the for the whole team right both the, both the remote and the virtu and the uh, local ones. Um, you want to have an online team directory with photos of each person and contact information. If you are not in the same room with these people, you want to see their faces. You want to know what they look like. When you run in, when you do have a chance to meet them in real life, you don't want them to be stranger. You want to feel like you know who these people are. Uh, you should treat adding a person to a virtual team in the same way that you treat adding a new employee to a company. They need that same kind of orientation and, uh, and attention. Um, I would say that one of the things that Drupal has been accused of um, having problems with, you know, is new people approaching the Drupal community and feeling like they, you know, they don't belong and nobody wants them and, you know, nobody wants to hear what I have to say, that kind of thing. It's that, it's that same kind of, you know, that's that sense that this new person who's trying to join this virtual team doesn't feel welcome, doesn't feel like they're a part of something, and that's important. Um, each team member should have an understanding of the, what the others are doing and how each person fits in with the rest of the group. And again, it's easy, it's easy for, to miss this. It's easy for this not to happen, but it's really important. Uh, documentation and data sharing is vital. 
you know, this is all kind of a lot of the same thing. We, we, we need to know what's going on. We have to have ways of communicating with each other. And so we kind of have, like at Lullabot, we have, um, I, I'd say, like five kind of big buckets of things that build the infrastructure um, that I think are important to a lot of teams. So first of all, you need some sort of a team intranet. You need a, you need a central point of contact, um, and that should have a directory on it so you know who all the team members are. You need a way to share files. Uh, you're going to have to have a way to get files back and forth. You need some way of calendaring and keeping track of events and, and uh, that kind of thing. You probably need a time tracking. Not, not every team needs time tracking, uh, but I would say that maybe more of them need it than realize it. And then you need lots of communication channels. You don't need just one communication channel. You need multiple communication channels. So, uh, for instance, our Lullabot intranet is super simple Drupal site, right? Um, nothing, nothing really fancy. We've got a place where we've got client information and documentation. We've got a place where we've got our team directory. Uh, we can bookmark. We've got an ability to bookmark that's just flags. This is just a super, super easy uh, Drupal site. And then, you know, blogging about things like birthdays and benefits and, you know, company news and all that kind of thing. Um, we've used Open Atrium in the past. It, it wasn't a particularly good match for exactly what we were trying to do, so we aren't using it right now, but that's another alternative. Uh, there's a lot of companies that use things like Basecamp. Um, for this purpose, there, there's a lot of tools out there. It doesn't really matter what you use. The point is that you need something. Um, and then how are you going to manage files? Um, we're using Dropbox. And I think Dropbox is mostly pretty good. It's not a perfect solution either. I, I don't know if there is a perfect solution for sharing files. Um, but Dropbox is working pretty well for us. Um, I think what you need for file sharing that's important is you need a way to say, we've got some files that need to be kept private and we've got other files that we need to share with people. So we need a way that that can happen. You know, if a client needs a file, how can you get that file to them? And at the same time, you've got private files and you want your private files to stay private. Uh, you probably want to have some way of doing some sort of hierarchical organization of your files. Dropbox gives you that. Uh, some people just put files into something like Basecamp, um, and I don't know if you can do a hierarchical uh, organization. I've, the, the, the ones I've seen didn't, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a way to do it. Um, Cross-platform accessibility is really important, like Dropbox I can get to from any machine that I'm on. It's got um, it's got an iPhone app, it's got an Android app, it's got like, lots of different ways that I can get to my files, and I've got some revision history. So all those things are really important. Um, and then you could say like GitHub would be, um, you know, more an, another way is um, GitHub for your code repository. Um, you need a calendaring system. Now we use Google Calendar, and Google Calendar is pretty powerful. And one of the things that's nice about Google Calendar is you can combine multiple calendars into the same one. So when you see the two different colors here, this, this is an example of somebody that's got a couple of different calendars. And so what we do, for instance, at Lullabot is we've got a calendar that is our regular, you know, everybody's got their regular calendar. And then we've got a calendar that keeps track of who's out of the office. So we've got an OOO calendar. And I can bring the OOO calendar into my thing and I can see that Oh yeah, um, so and so's out today. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna find him. He's he's out today. Um, we've got a, a a conference call calendar. So we've got a set an, another calendar where we keep track of all the conference calls. Who's using what conference call lines? You could do a a calendar for meeting rooms, which doesn't apply in our situation, but somebody might find something like that useful. So you can have lots of different calendars that are uh, used for different purposes. Um, and then everybody can bring them into their own calendars and see that information. Very handy. Um, time tracking. I told, I, I said, um, I mentioned the idea that not everybody thinks that they need to track time or wants to track time. We're currently using something called Let's Freckle, which is an online tracking system. Um, I like it really well. Periodically, we have debates about whether it's the right answer, whether there's a better way to track time, and then we go look at other ways to track time, and then. A lot of times we end up back here again, but but we do we do from time to time kind of revisit this question of um, what's the best way to track time. But we can you can put projects in here. When I started at Lullabot a long time ago, way back when it was, um, we didn't track time. 
we actually, uh, the only time we track time is if we were billing time. So if you were working on a project where you weren't billing time and materials, nobody tracked time. And we found out over time, we found out that it's actually useful to track time for everything, even if it's not a billing situation, if it, even if there's not a billing question. So, you can, so what we've got is we've got buckets for things like internal time, or we put a bucket in there for uh, working on the company website. And you can keep track of you know, how much time are people spending on these kinds of things. Um, the, the tough part about that is getting people to actually do it, right? Um, so you really have to keep up with those kinds of things. Once you, you have to get into the habit of tracking time, and it's really useful when you're at home to, be, to know what it is you are spending your time on. Um, so there's basically two ways to do it. You can use some sort of a timer where you're just constantly keeping track of what you're doing, and then you click, you know, done, and, and, and you post it. Or you do something where you kind of catch up at the end of the day. That I tend to do the second because I do so much switching back and forth between things that I don't find that the timer works. You can wait to the end of the week or the month, but you will, odds are, have forgotten what you actually did do. Um, and like I said, the important thing is that we're finding that this is kind of transcends billing. It's, it's really just time management. This is, this is keeping track of how you're spending your time and not just for management, but for the employee as well. So everybody knows, you know, where, where's my time going? Um, but again, uh, trying to get people to actually do it sometimes requires some gentle reminders. So we've come up with the Freckle Fairy, and if you uh, don't post your time, you get an email from the Freckle Fairy, and if she has to, she might post it in a public place where you're going to be shamed. So. Uh, People are getting pretty good about now posting their arms, their hours now. Um, so I, we've we've got I'm quoting quoting various people because we've we've had conversations about what are what are suggestions about working at home, and one of them that Seth came up with is you know track your time. You you really you you want to know if, that you're spending enough time, but you also want to know that you're not going you know spending too much time. You know maybe if you're spending too much time on something, maybe you're spinning your wheels. Maybe you should be asking for help. You know, maybe there's a problem, um, but the only way to know how you're spending your time is to track it. Another thing that we use is called Yammer, and Yammer, if you're not familiar with it, is basically Twitter, but it's kind of a private Twitter, so it's not open to the public. Everybody can't see it. Um, it's it's uh, something that's constrained so that we we can feel free to like put <coughs> names of clients into our Yammers and that kind of thing. We're using Yammer as sort of an announcement, right? Okay, I'm, um, I just got done working on such and such a project, and I'm, or I'm getting ready to work on something else. We do lots of things with Yammer. We keep finding more and more ways to use Yammer. Um, we do something called the hive mind. So let's say you're stuck on a problem and you say, you know, I feel like this is a problem somebody else has solved, and I'll post something and I'll put hashtag hive mind. And that means, hey, anybody know the answer to this question? Anybody got any good solutions? And you know, a lot of times somebody else does. Um, so we do the hive mind things, and then we we uh, say, you know, like this is an example of oh, I, f I found this really great uh, resource that we could use, and you know, we can share this resource. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we use Yammer. But what it all comes down to is you absolutely have to find good ways to communicate. Um, and one of the things that's important if you're going to be a manager on a remote team is you have to have good communication skills. It's the manager's job to stay on top of everybody. There's a whole bunch of things that we'd use for uh, communication channels. So email, obvious email. Uh, we use email lists all over the place. So for instance, uh, we have an email list to team, and that is all the people on the team. So if you want to make sure that everybody on the team knows something, you just have to copy the team email list. And then every project that we set up gets an email list. And so if you want to send an email out to everybody that's involved on a certain project, you don't have to go look up all their names or worry about whether you've left somebody out or anything like that. You just copy, um, you copy that email list. It's really great for making sure that people aren't left out of the loop. And I think that's uh, one of the really valuable things about it. Obviously, you want a, a mobile phone. You need a way to do conference calls. Um, 
we use something called TurboBridge. There's, there's a bunch of different services that you can use for conference calls, but you have to think through how are we gonna do conference calls? Uh, and if you're the remote employee and, and you've got the company set up, they're gonna have to figure out how are they gonna conference call you in, right? So one way or the other, there has to be a conference call solution. Uh, IRC is like the mainstay. Everybody sits in IRC all the time, and you're expected to. And the, the idea is, first of all, you're easy to ping, and second, it also lets everybody know that you're there. You know, it's, you know, I'm here, I'm available, I'm working. You can, you can reach me if you need to. Um, so that's the idea with IRC. We use Yammer for all kinds of things, um, for personal things as well as business things. Um, and then Skype and Google Hangouts. Google Hangouts are great. So the bottom line is all teams need good c communication, but co-located co teams, so co-located would be the opposite of remote. We're all in the same place. Uh, have more chances to stumble across information. Uh, I, I, I started a bunch of conversations with people about like what's good about working remotely, what's wrong with it, what works, what doesn't work. And one of the responses I was getting was they're harder to manage. And I think it's interesting because there's nothing about managing a remote team that isn't a good idea for any team. It's just that you have to do it. And with a, with a co-located team, you can get away with not doing it. But with a remote team, you can't get away with not doing it. Um, and actually, I was thinking about the grapevine, right? So, well, so some people say, well, you know, the remote people, they don't, they don't hear the grapevine. Well, you know, the grapevine is really sort of a failure of communication, you know, it's sort of a response to a failure in communication. Somebody didn't tell somebody everything they needed to know and the grapevine tries to pick up the pieces. Um, so the fact that you don't have the grapevine is, is really just a signal, or the grapevine is just a signal that, that there's communication's not going on. So then we've got to talk about phone calls, because there's going to be lots of them. Um, so some, uh, now here are my five commandments for phone calls. Um, thou shalt use a headset. Uh, this, we, we have to kind of teach people this because if they're not used to being on a remote team or in a, in a phone call that includes a lot of people, they don't always realize this. But if you have more than two people on a call and they don't have headsets on, you start picking up background noise, you start hearing somebody clicking on the keyboard, all kinds of things, it, it gets really confusing and noisy um, and it's just, you just have to say, people on a call with more than two people have to use a headset. And the corollary to that is when you're not talking, you should be muted. Um, thou shalt ta-da. So, so one of the things that happens when you've got a, a, a conference call or a call with a lot of people involved is sometimes you can have what some people like to call the Thunderdome thing, right? Everybody's talking over everybody and you can't tell who's talking and when they're done and all that kind of thing. So a couple of things that are really helpful. First of all, there should be somebody leading the call and we try to do that. A lot of times it's the person that, call, that called, the, called it, right, that, that set it up. But somebody should be sort of taking control of the call and saying, okay, Jim, what do you think? Okay, wait a minute, that's enough, Karen. Let's, let's hear what Sue has to say, you know, that kind of thing, sort of doing that. You also need a way to communicate that you're done talking so, they can, so somebody knows, okay, now I can, I can move in. What we started doing at Lullabot, and I don't even know who started this thing, um, is when you get all done talking, you say, ta-da. So, blah, 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 ta-da. And that means I'm finished and somebody else can talk now. And it's hilarious because we bring other people in on our calls, clients and things, and they're all picking it up. And so pretty soon you hear the clients are starting to do ta-da on their calls. It's, I think it's, it's a lot of fun, but it works. It's very effective. Um, yeah, again, you have to have a conference call system and, and you have to think about an international calls as well. Um, we're in a global community. Some people maybe will never, ever, ever have any reason to either need to have somebody international dial in or out. Um, and keeping in mind that even Canada is international, um, you have to think through how are we gonna do this? If somebody from uh, outside the US needs to dial in, how are they gonna do it? Do we have a number they can use? Is it gonna cost them a million dollars? How's this gonna work? And vice versa, if we need to call them, how are we gonna call them? Uh, Skype is sometimes an answer, but not everybody can use Skype, and so you can't rely on that. Um, sometimes it works. 
So now we're really, really good. We are commuting, communicating the heck out of everything. We are copying everybody on every email. We are pulling people into a million phone calls. We need to do that, but the corollary to that is now we've got information overload. So what do we do about that? Well, we have to, we have to balance the availability with um, a way to get away from it a little bit. Um, and so one way we can do that is, well, there's a, a, a couple of ways. This is an interesting suggestion that I just ran across when I was um, uh, researching this topic. We actually haven't been doing this, but it might be a good idea. Uh, when, you're, when you're sending an email blast to you know, everybody on a list that, to say, the CC means I'm just letting you know, but you don't have to do anything, but the two means I expect you to respond. Um, I think that might be an interesting idea to try. Um, you want to schedule time to speak with each other, each other. So the idea is you don't want to just like constantly interrupt each other. Nobody's going to get anything done if they're being constantly pinged and interrupted um, and, and stopping what they're doing to answer questions and that kind of thing. So you uh, ideally you want to, unless it's an emergency, say, okay, Jared, I need to talk to you. Um, what's a good time? Um, I'd be available after 2 p.m. today and we set up a time and we figure out when we're going to talk and, it, and, it, and we can both fit it into our schedule. Uh, and, and, and similarly, you can schedule time to go dark. So you can say, okay, I've got this project going on. I really need to focus on this thing. I mean, I cannot, I cannot have all this other stuff going on. I need to just be heads down in this project. And um, so what we've started doing, a lot of us are doing, is uh, we'll yammer uh, something like, um, I've got this big project. I am going to go offline for two hours. Um, you know, if, you, if it's an emergency, go, try and contact me. Otherwise, you know, I'll be back in a couple hours. Something like that. So you're kind of announcing to people that you're letting people know what, what, uh, what you're doing and what, uh, what to expect, but you're giving yourself a chance to kind of step back and actually get something accomplished. So then we have body language. So one of the things that happens when you're dealing with a remote team, especially when everybody is not in front of you, is if I'm hearing silence on the other end of the line, am I seeing, is, is that somebody smiling and nodding their head or is that somebody looks like this? And you don't know, right? You don't know which one silence is. Um, so this is an issue. You, you, you're missing body language. That's one of the things that happens when you're remote is you don't get the body language cl clues. And you have to be very conscious of the fact that you're not getting those clues. And silence does not mean necessarily mean agreement. It does not necessarily mean I understand. It may be total confusion. Uh, who knows? So what we have to do is we have to find out, you know, how can we kind of solve for this problem that we don't have body language when we're uh, dealing with remote teams. So first, there's, there's basically two solutions. So one solution is you've got to explicitly ask questions. Okay, you get done explaining something, you hear dead silence. I mean, if people are saying, yes, 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 I, I agree, you know, you know you've got agreement. But if you're not hearing anything, you don't know what that silence means. So you've got to ask. You've got to say, does that sound right? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Did you understand what I was saying? Uh, you have to do that. And then the second one is you can use something where there is a visual element. So you could do something like Skype or Google Hangout or something where you actually can see the person that you're talking to and get some of those body language clues. And again, another quote from some of the research, I had to totally change my work process, process and be much more direct when asking people how they're feeling or acting. I have to translate what I, and I think what this was supposed to say is I have to translate what I would have picked up from body language. You know, in other words, there is no body language, so I've got to figure out a solution for that. So we do things, we do Google Hangouts, and we have a lot of fun. And sometimes when we have this really tough problem that we're dealing with, the, the, the best part is, this, I'll bet they were talking about something really serious and, and it was like they're all just going, ah, you know, and then you, they're just going to have a little fun and break the ice a little bit and then they're going to get back and, and solve the problem. Um, another problem that you have with remote is isolation. So you've got people that are kind of out away from everybody else. Um, and again, keep in mind that all of these things could be like a remote office just as well as a, 
an individual remote employee working from home. So you've got isolation, you've got this sense that you are separated or left out or, or missing out on things. Um, you're, you're not a part of the mothership, you're missing something, you don't know what's going on. Um, so this came up over and over again as a potential problem, you know, people feeling like they were left out. So how do you get around this? Um, so this is an area where a manager can really make a difference. So a manager who's really kind of conscious of the fact that this can happen and this does happen. Um, one of the things that some of the comments talked about was the idea that uh, an employee or a team member might not be comfortable saying, I feel left out. You know, they might not ever verbalize that. And so the, you need to, the, man, the managers need to kind of check in. Are you doing okay? Haven't heard from you lately. Things going all right? You know, you know kind of keep that thing going. Um, and the, the other thing that the managers can do that really helps is keep communicating the big picture. How do, how do you fit into the big picture? What's going, the reason why you gotta do this crazy project is because of this. You know, here's the big thing that's going on. Here's your piece of it. This is why this little thing that looks so screwy is really important and it's a, you know, it, it needs to happen. And then confirming understanding. Again, silence may or may not mean anything. So you've gotta, you've gotta do that check to see. Um, then we have the things like the work-family balance. We t said, you know, working from home means it's nice. You, you've got the ability to be involved in more things in the family, but you also have the opposite. You have the family everywhere, right? And, and sometimes it's hard to get separated from them. So what a lot of people are saying is things like, you know, my, the way that I do this is when my office door is closed, it means leave me alone, I, I need some quiet time. I, 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 need to, I need you to pretend I'm not here, basically. Um, it's, a real, it's a real risk. I, everybody that works from home, I think, would agree that there is a tendency for everybody to sort of assume you're here, that means you're available and just ping you all the time. Uh, and you have, to, you have to have a way to communicate when you're not. So I, I just pulled out some pictures. These are things that have been posted on Yammer of our team sort of balancing their work and family stuff. And we all figure it out, right? Eventually we all figure it out. I love that picture. Um, so another issue is time zones. If you're, if you're dealing with more than one time zone, and if you're in a remote team, odds are you are dealing with more than one time zone. There's, there's two ways to deal with multiple time zones, a team that has multiple time zones. You can either say, we're, we're gonna pick out a block of time when everybody's gonna be available. We're all gonna be working simultaneously. We're gonna have some overlap period, um, and it's early for some people and it's late for other people, but this is the period when we expect people to be around and we're all gonna work together. Or you can say, we're not all gonna be working simultaneously, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna do these handoffs. So, you know, team A is working nine to five and then they're gonna hand off to team B that's gonna pick up and work from five to 11, et cetera, et cetera. So basically you've got one of, those, uh, one of those two things going on. It's really hard to figure out how to schedule meetings across time zones. I found the neatest, um, this is a really useful thing if you, if you have to do this kind of thing, uh, this worldtimebuddy.com Basically what you can do is you can pull up a list of time zones that your team members are in, and then you can pull your calendar into the top, and then you can look down the list and say, okay, here's an opening on my calendar, and here's what time it would be in everybody's time zone on the team, and I could, I could send an email and try to, you know, I could put it on my calendar and send an invitation out or whatever, but I can see uh, what this means, you know, and I could tell that, oh, that's three in the morning for somebody, that's not gonna work, right? Another way to do it, um, where the time zones are less obvious, but I know some people like to use doodle.com, so this would be something where basically you don't ever see what everybody else's time zones are, but you figure out some times that are good for you, and then everybody else sees those times in their own time zone, and they can respond yes or no to them. Uh, the downside of this is you can't tell, you know, the thing that, you know, that you've just sent something that was two o'clock in the morning for somebody, uh, but this can be useful too. If you're gonna do a 24 seven handoff, um, one of the things you gotta keep in mind is that if you don't, 
if you don't answer all the questions that need to be answered when you do that handoff, you are basically going to lose a day of work because now that you know you handed off and you went away and you're not there anymore, and now you your your 24/7 team may be sitting there with you know twiddling their thumbs because they needed a piece of information and they didn't get it. So you have to be really conscious of that. There are also cultural issues. There's all kinds of things that you don't even think about because everybody is so sure that everybody else thinks the way that they do. I mean, it just doesn't even occur to us to think about this. But there are cultures where working through lunch, nobody works through lunch. And there are cultures where, of course, you work through lunch. Um, when does the day start and end? Um, do you work on weekends? Do you not work on weekends? What are the holidays? Who, who has holidays when? You have to, you have to um, explicitly call all these things out. There are actually, and there are also cultural differences on communication styles. So here is a couple of examples. And so this was one team that had Dutch members and US members and the US team said, um, okay, well, let's meet next Thursday. And the Dutch, Dutch members said, sure. However, it turned out that the US team thought that next Thursday meant the upcoming Thursday, and the Dutch team meant, thought that it meant Thursday of the following week. So you, again, you, you just you can't make assumptions. Um, and then another, another example, American faculty member said, we'll tell the students to adopt the chosen procedure, and then the Dutch faculty supervisor said, we'll discuss the procedure with the students. You know, just, just that different culture, uh, cultural response to how you communicate. And on top of culture, we have language. So we can have multiple languages. And one of the things that we have to be really conscious of is for those people who don't have English as their primary language, um, you need to be careful because if you start moving too fast, they may be thinking about how to respond and you've moved on to the next subject and you've completely left them in the dust. And so you have to, you have to be conscious of the fact that they may, be, they may, need, a little, may need a little extra time to stay caught up with you. Um, all kinds of interesting things can happen. They said the holiday schedules, um, you want to let, let everybody know what the holiday schedules are. Um, there were, one of the things that came up was the idea that uh, the people who are proficient in speaking English are not necessarily the experts on the team. So this was an example where there was a team of um, people that spoke different languages and the experts on the team were not proficient in English so they sort of sat in the background and the people that, that were communicating were, were actually the junior members of the team, but they were the ones that knew English. And so the, the American team treated them as though they were the experts, and they treated the experts as though they were the juniors. And you know, so these funny things happen. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is uh, one of the solutions for language problems is, is that a lot of people are going to find it easier to write or read a foreign language than to speak it. And so using text, you know, confirming things in writing, um, writing things as, as opposed to trying to, to um, read and speak everything can be a, a way to help get across that. Um, yeah, this was that example, the, the junior members. And then this was an example of, of somebody who didn't speak English well, who, who uh, thought that they had somebody who was who made the team really successful and they said when I ask a question They didn't just say yes, but they said yes, you mean this and this they told me what I thought I meant Then they then I could say yes, you're right And then they would send a little story about the meeting and went and what the outcome was so I could read this and look if it was right So the idea again of of saying okay, this is someone who's who's doesn't have English as their primary language We want to make sure that they understood what we thought they understood um, and confirm that um, so another thing we want to do is we want to develop rapport. Uh, we've got a bunch of people that aren't in the same room, uh, but we want them to feel like they belong together. And I think that's one of the things that Lullabot has, has done really well at. And so I've been trying to figure out, like, how do you make that magic happen? Uh, because it's important. Um, one of the suggestions I came up, and we actually don't do this, but this was a suggestion that came up was doing a virtual lunch one, once a month, um, trying to build rapport. We use Yammer a lot. I see Yammer as one of our things that kind of build rapport. Uh, I love this one. My mom has a mom, and she's my grandma. Mom has a dad, and he's my grandpa. Dad has a mom. Dad has a dad. There are many, many people who love me. And then Andrew says, this is a great excuse to start teaching recursion. You know, <laughs> um, 
all these things. And, the, and all kinds of things, like uh, somebody will start a thread and they'll say, everybody put up a picture of what it looks like out your window. Or, or somebody else will sh uh, send in a, a radar map and a big X and say, this is my house, I'm going for cover, you know. And uh, we, we, um, a bunch of us have Fitbits and we're, we got like a contest going to say, you know, who's gonna do the most steps and Fitbit keeps track of that and then every time somebody comes up to the top of the list, they post it and say, ha. I'm, I'm the winner, uh, and then somebody else beats them later. But all of these are really great rapport building things, and we, we, we go around sometimes because there's a lot of, quote, noise on Yammer because of all this stuff, but I also think this is really valuable because if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have that sense of rapport. Um, and then the baby pictures. I mean, we, we've, we've got all these, what we, Lola kids now, and we got, so we got all the baby pictures posted all the time, and they're all, they're all sweeties. Um, the other thing that you can do is you, you need to make opportunities to, to see people in real life. Um, so if you are literally remote, you still have to make, create those opportunities. They have to be days when you're do, uh, you could do co-working, uh, you can have retreats, you can have on-site meetings, but you need to, you need to have those periodically. I'm, I'm not sure how possible it is to really have rapport uh, with a group of people that you never, ever, ever see. Um, it is possible to have a good relationship with them, but I think it's important to have those in real, those real life things, or real life opportunities. Um, and then we've got hybrid teams, and these are really challenging. So the team where most of the people are local, but there's a few remote people. Um, one of the things, we, we had asked a question, uh, or Matt, I guess it was Matt asked the question at one point about you know, why do you, how do you feel about working at a remote, uh, at a company where you're remote? And I think almost everybody that responded said, it's so much better if everybody's remote than if like there's this one lonely person who's remote and you're it, right? Because you, you tend to get forgotten. Um, that's not an impossible thing to fix, but management has to be really conscious in that kind of situation to, to not let that remote person get lost. Um, so that, I think that's an especially challenging management issue. Um, we, you need to have a feeling of trust. Um, you need to, to feel like you can trust the other people on the team. And a lot of that comes back to, uh, you know, if, if the other people on the team are doing all this communication, if they're telling, they're talking about what they're doing, you, you know what's going on. You'll, you'll have that sense of, of whether or not they're doing what you expect them to be doing and, you know, is so-and-so getting behind and all that. If they've, if they've gone dark, if they've gone into a hole and disappeared, uh, you have no idea. And, and that's, a, that's a real problem for trust. Uh, on the management side, the idea is managers need to be really proactive, right? They, they can't just wait until a problem devolves into chaos. Um, they have to be like, probing all the time, you know, things okay, everything going all right, do you need anything? Um, lots of praise, public praise, let people know what's going on, let, let people know that they're doing the right thing. Um, this was an example of a horrible manager. The silent approach inclu included screening phone calls from remote colleagues, not returning calls and emails, leaving them out of the loop, and avoiding working with them altogether. So, you know, this is the guy you don't want to work with. So my management commandments, uh, thou shalt initiate communication. Um, the management is, is got to take the responsibility, I think, for creating a sense of identity for the team um, and making sure that everything is documented and documented in a place that everybody can get a hold of it and, the, and showing everyone the big picture. Um, I think that's really important. So then the last thing I wanna talk about is meetings. So we have meetings. Um, so we have a remote meeting. We've got, uh, in particular, um, uh, online meetings are easier than they ever used to be. So we've got Skype, we've got Google Hangouts, we've got GoToMe. It used to be expensive and complicated and hard, and you had to have all this crazy equipment. And it's so easy now to do, um, to do meetings, online meetings. Um, you can do mixed media. We do this all the time, where uh, maybe we've all got the same Skype number, but we're using something else for the video, uh, go to a meeting or join me or something. Um, really important to make sure ahead of time that everything works, um, 
there is nothing worse than a meeting where you've got you know a dozen people in the line and the person that's running the meeting is trying to figure out how to get the thing to show to, you know to, to work you know I can't figure out how to get WebEx to work um, so you need, you want to get that all figured out ahead of time um, practice makes perfect so I feel like it, it's crazy to keep jumping around and using different kinds of, find a system that works for you and get really good at using it and know how to use it and keep using it. Um, I really think, and I, I've seen a failure on this one a lot. Um, when you're on a remote meeting, a lot of times it's, it's very easy not to know who else is in the meeting. Uh, I think it's really important for whoever's leading the meeting to make sure that everybody knows who's there who's in the meeting, and not just who's there, who are they, right? I don't know how many, well, it hasn't happened a whole lot of times, but it's happened a few times where I thought somebody was a junior person, and it turns out like they were a really important person, and I probably would have answered a question a little differently if I'd known that. Um, it's really important, I think, uh, to make sure that that gets communicated. Uh, who are these people? And then sending documents in the agenda ahead of time um, there's nothing worse, I don't think, than getting into a meeting where you're just sort of ambushed. You know, we're going to talk about what, whoa, 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 we're going to talk about what? I had no idea we were going to talk about that. I'm not prepared for that at all. Um, and ahead of time ideally means more than five minutes before the call. <laughs> and those of, those of you on my team know who I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, meetings. Okay, again, um, a meeting needs a leader. Um, in particular, a, a meeting that inv involves remote people needs a leader, and that leader needs to be constantly paraphrasing, making sure that everybody understands, and you know, trying to keep one person from dominating the conversation, drawing other people in, and in particular, don't forget the, you know, not forgetting the people that are on the phone. Okay, you know, the people in the room a lot of times will dominate the conversation and the people on the phone will sort of get lost and, and you need a leader who will say, okay, let's hear from the people on the phone. You know, what do you think? Um, encourage personal conversation before and after. I think that's wonderful, but uh, the meeting needs to stay focused. I think one of the most difficult things is the hybrid meetings. You've got, you've got a bunch of local people and then a couple of remote people. Um, if you've ever been the one on the phone in these things, how awful is it when you can hear people like talking quietly in the corners, but you have no idea what they're saying? It's just, it's, you know, again, you need the, the meeting leader that sort of keeps this stuff from happening. Um, make sure that the people on the phone can hear everything. Um, make sure they understand what's going on. Don't use visuals that not everyone can see. This happens um, a lot. Um, we just decided we're going to pull something up on the screen or we're going to put it up on the wall and then the people on the phone are just out of luck because they have no idea what you're looking at. Um, the other thing that I've seen is sometimes you send out materials ahead of time and we're all looking at the same material, like we're paging through a PDF or something like that. You have to keep saying, okay, now I'm on page 10. Now I'm on page 11 because the people on the phone are not going to be able to know that. Um, so we say it's hard to get your point across if you don't have virtual a, a whiteboard. But there's again, there's lots of good solutions for this now. We've got Skype, we've got Google Hangouts, Go to Meeting, Join Me. You can share your screens. Um, there's so many ways to do this. Hackpad. I don't know if you're familiar with Hackpad, but it's um, it's a document uh, right. It's, it's a document that you can get several people in, and you can all be writing simultaneously um, and like keep notes about what's going on in the meeting. Google Docs, which is the same, same kind of idea. You can, you can share a Google Doc and everybody can see the same thing at the same time. And you can have, a, you can have a, an audio call with a Google Doc. So you're all looking at a Google Doc and you're listening on the call, but because it's real time, you can all see what's going on with the document. So there's a lot of ways to fix that. Clarify the purpose of every discussion um, and summarize decisions that were made. Um, I'm gonna, okay, so this is it. Um, so what, do I want, what are the takeaways that I wanted to get? First of all, the things that make remote teams work make all teams work better. This is, it's not that these things aren't needed for teams that are not remote, it's just they're critical for remote teams and they're also important for teams that are not remote. You can't over communicate, there's no way to do it. Um, however much you communicate is probably not enough. 
both members and managers have to be available and visible, and the infrastructure has to be right. So remote can work. And I, don't, I guess we don't really have uh, time for questions, although I, I suppose I could take one if anybody's got a real quick question. Uh, there's a mic back there. You probably need to jump back there. You showed that slide on whiteboards. Which of those are uh, competent in like collaborative markup? So you can actually truly collaborate virtually. And another question is, how do you, what are the special needs you need for uh, presenting to clients in this situation? Okay, I'm not sure I understood the question, so hang on a second. So the first question was whether the, the tools were collaborative. So the collaborative tools would be like Hackpad or Google Docs. Those are ones that you can be working in simultaneously. Was that the first question? You, different, pe different people, right. Different people can, can all be working in it at the same time. Both of those will, will do that. Uh, I didn't understand the second question, though. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to take a stab at trying to rephrase that. So you're saying when you're dealing with a client, um, language? Are you talking about language? Body language. Body, oh, body language. Oh, right, right. Yes, so body, you're missing the body language when you're dealing with a client. We really do try to have an on-site pretty early on in most engagements so that we're not like, this is nobody we've ever seen before. Um, that you'll you'll still have meetings where you know where you can't see the body language, but there the best you can do is is just keep asking, right? Did that make sense? Did you understand that? Does that look right to you? You know, and that's that's probably the best uh, solution I can think of. Yeah. So uh, this one is potentially, I suppose, kind of a negative question, and I definitely don't mean it that way, but. <laughs> Probably one of the hard parts is for management with a fully remote team, if you have examples from Lullabot, how have you identified underperformance and have you dealt with it? Okay, dealing with performance on a, on a remote team is, is probably really no different than dealing with performance on, on any other team. Uh, it, the difference is that managers have to manage a little differently. So to know what people are doing, they have to be in communication with them and the employee has to be in communication with the manager. Um, so it, a lot of it is about everybody staying, uh, communicating with each other enough that, that the employee knows what's going on and the manager knows what's going on. You know, beyond that, it's, it's probably the same as it would be anywhere else. You have a review, you know, you, you talk through things in a review. Um, but the evaluation is the work that you've done and, and your, you know, the, the visible things that you have communicated. I think I'll take that one question, then I, need to, I know I need to end. Go ahead. Do you have ideas for virtual parties or virtual celebrations with remote teams? <laughs> virtual celebrations. Um, yeah, the, the, a small group could do a Google Hangout, I guess, but I, that wouldn't work for a big group. I don't know what you would do for a big group. There's a blog post about that? So there's, he said there's a blog post about everybody takes a picture of themselves with a beer or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have any good ideas about that. All right. I think I need to end because the next session needs to get in here. But thank you very much.